Last December, there was a gathering of the excellent organization, the Young Britons Foundation, yeah, 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 yeah. in Cambridge. Last year, the Young Britons Foundation launched a new award, the Lifetime Warrior Award. And the first award was given for a lifetime of achievement to Margaret Thatcher. Last December, the award was presented to me on behalf of Lord Tebbit. And it's my pleasure today to have the award with me and to be able to give it to Norman today. Citation reads, winner of the Lifetime Warrior Award 2013, the Right Honourable the Lord Tebbit, Companion of Honour, for bravely standing up to left-wing zealots, trade union thugs, Republican terrorists, and the politically correct chattering classes, and for representing the true voice of conservatism, even to this day, online. Yeah. We are honoured that Lord Tebbit is with us today. Lord Tebbit is one of the towering giants of 20th century British politics. The Observer once wrote a profile of Norman where they said, if a wasp flew into Norman Tebbit's mouth, he would sting it. <laughs> Norman once said of the old adage, don't get mad, get even. I get mad and even. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of honour, Lord Tebbit. Thank you for those kind words, and thank you for your reception. Is there anyone here of a superstitious turn of mind? Because if so, I should say that the reason I didn't collect that reward in person in December was that uh, the Young Britons had organised their meeting in mid-December, quite carelessly not looking of the calendar. They had invited my good friend of many, many years, Cecil Parkinson, to come to speak to them. Sadly, shortly before the meeting was due, Cecil had to go back into hospital with a reoccurrence of the cancer which had dogged him for some years. He suggested they should call me as I lived fairly nearby, and asked me to do the meeting. So of course I did. I said yes. At half past one in the morning of the day of the meeting, I was carried out of my house on a stretcher. <laughs> That's when we realised it was Friday the 13th. <laughs> so do be careful about the date. <laughs> Happily, I'm more or less recovered. But, to be more serious, the threat to freedom is always there. It will never go away. There is a great division between those who believe that society is best run from the centre with the instructions going down to the individuals and between those of us who believe that society is better run if we have our lateral contacts between each other which crucially of course depend upon the family and our common interests. Socialism and the threat to freedom is really rather like those people in the 1950s who believed that the future of data processing would be an enormous central processor 
which would send its instructions and receive information back from other little ones around the country, none of whom would connect with each other. But in fact, as we all know, technology is on the side of freedom. And all those little computers talk to each other in the way that we as individual humans do. That is what freedom is about. It allows many flowers to grow. And it is essential that we who are freedom lovers understand how that process works. We are here, I think, mostly conservatives. It's, it's very difficult not to be a conservative, small c, if you are a believer in freedom. We know that the giant plan always comes unstuck. We know that it is far better that it is built up from the bottom than dictated from down at the top. Errors are more easily dealt with. They do not have such catastrophic results. We need to now look at what has been happening in society recently. Michael Grove, Gove is bravely challenging the blob. <laughs> the educational system which allows kids to leave school illiterate and innumerate. And therefore a natural target for the authoritarians. We, educational reformers, believe that we should open education to many different paths to find the best way for each individual to develop his or her talents. Certainly until recently it has seemed that the challenges to freedom would not arrive in panzers or armoured vehicles from Eastern Europe. Perhaps we've got a bit complacent about the possibility that that might happen again. Perhaps we've got very complacent about the threats to freedom which have been developing here in our own country, not least through the takeover of so many quangos mm. and similar organisations by the hard left. We have uh, seen the Harmon affair mm. of using a council for civil liberties to advance the cause of paedophilia because that would have attacked society. <coughs> we see it time and time again. And what we have to do now is to identify some of those threats, identify some of the people who are involved in making those threats, and make sure that our institutions are responsible to the people and not to their masters. Big challenge, as young Hannon here knows, we've also got the blob based in Brussels. <laughs> which is a centralist, essentially authoritarian organisation and which derives much of its power from the fact that we do not speak to each other across boundaries very easily. We're divided by history and language. <coughs> so the European citizens tend to talk up and down with Brussels. These are great challenges for our friends on the continent of Europe. They are also great challenges to us. And it may well be that sometime in the future, the best way in which we can ensure the long-term interests and the freedom, not only of ourselves, but of the people of Europe, will be to come back and bring our expeditionary forces 
back from the continent endure some degree of difficulty but remain as we did in 1940 as the land from which freedom spread again across the continent. Good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there and I'll keep at it for as long as I can last. Oh. Thank you.